This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thank you for joining us for this Martin Luther King weekend edition of NC Spin. It's been a really important week, and we want to start by asking why the legislature met for only one day. Then we discuss the ongoing controversies of Superintendent Mark Johnson and especially his emergency appropriation for reading test curriculum. We then look at the settlement made between Duke Energy and our Department of Environmental Quality over coal ash. And of course, we're going to ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Speaking of which, they include this week Donna Martinez from WPTF Radio and the John Locke Foundation, John Hood, syndicated columnist and author, Chris Fitzsimon, who's director of the newsroom, and Brad Crone, who's a communications and political campaign consultant. We'll begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages from our underwriters. Today's tools make you a real DIYer, and as a member of an electric cooperative, you have lots of valuable tools to help you do it yourself in controlling your home energy use and budget, leaving you free to be dad. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end-of-life decisions, your family physician is with you every step, for every stage of life, for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Let's get started. North Carolina's General Assembly convened Tuesday for a one day session. The object was to see if enough Democrats showed up to uphold Governor Cooper's budget vetoes. It quickly became evident Republican leaders didn't have the votes, and lawmakers just as quickly adjourned until April 28th when they convened for the so-called short session. Brad Crone, uh, Republicans blame Governor Cooper uh, and the Democrats for not being able to pass pay raises for teacher and state employees. The governor blames the Republicans for not being willing to compromise and increase pay hikes. Who's the voters going to blame? Well, it's punker mentality. The Democrats are going to rally behind the governor, and the Republicans are going to rally behind the speaker and the president pro tem. The unaffiliated voters are left out there somewhere in the middle. Tom, the sad commentary is, is that we don't have the ability in either party right now to compromise for the good of the people. Interesting. Uh, Donna, prior to December 20th, the, the Democrats were always using the threats to hold their party in line on these veto overrides. That, that if you vote for, uh, if you vote with the Republicans, we're going to primary. We're going to find somebody to put in a primary. That wasn't that threat anymore. Uh, why did Republicans think they were going to be able to switch somebody uh, to, to override the veto? Well, hope lives, right? Um, everyone wants to think that they, they really have been persuasive behind the scenes and they could do something. One note, it, it is important to note that we actually do have a state budget, even though we've talked about we don't have one. There's a full and legal budget. It's last year's budget. It's 2018's budget. And yeah. um, it's got some tweaks in it from the mini budgets, but we do have a budget. But I think the politics of the whole thing is really fascinating when it comes to to teach or pay because remember over the last half a dozen years or so the Republicans in the legislature have voted for pay raises and over time it's been substantial average pay raises so if you're a voter and you are looking at November and this is your issue you face a question are you going to support people who actually have voted to raise your pay or are you going to support people who said no? So I want to ask John and Chris uh, on, on each side of this. Uh, John, how are the Republicans going to position what's happened here so far as the campaign in 2020 is concerned? I think they will make the following argument. When the Republicans came into office in the majority for the first time in 2011, they were coming after a recession and there were significant uh, reductions in education spending during the previous two years and over time while doing other things they've added money into education and particularly raised teacher pay significantly more uh, than the national average as far as the annual amounts if you total them over the course of time and they will say we enacted a teacher pay increase for this year but the governor vetoed it uh, we would like to have teacher pay raises for you talk to the governor 
That's yeah. going to be their message. So how are the Democrats <coughs> going to position this against the Republicans well, I think in part of it will be that we spend significantly less per capita on public school funding than we did before the Great Recession. The Republicans have changed the way we even calculate education spending, so they're not funding education properly. And North Carolina, uh, ref the Republicans in North Carolina refuse to even have a, co a conversation with the governor like Mike Pence did in Indiana, like the Republican governor of Kansas has done to provide health care to hundreds of thousands of people in the state. And the speaker broke his word by not having a House vote on a Republican Medicaid plan that passed a committee 25 to 6 with a significant number of Republicans voting for it. So all they had to do was figure out a way to have some Republican light even plan and the governor, I think, would have come to the table and we wouldn't be in this well, situation. Well, wait a second, because we could have addressed that back in the summertime. Remember, to their credit, the editorial boards of the Raleigh News and Observer and the Charlotte You're Observer. You're not going to the debate ridiculous. Yeah, no, that you, you think a debate, a debate is with, ridiculous? I think a debate with a they sitting governor and a legislature. What, what, when does that ever happen? What would be the point of that? The what, point, well, the, the exactly. The point would be the to impact, talk about it. There's plenty of ways to do that. Why have 30? Senator did, Berger said why yes. Why did Mike Pence expand Medicaid, no. Donna? Be, that was his choice. Right. Look, it's so is real, it a crazy left-wing idea then to expand Medicaid? The, there is a real issue with providing people access to affordable health insurance and affordable health right. care. And, and, and Medicaid expansion states. is just one way just to do it. That's why the, the discussion Democratic was case important. is not going to resolve the impasse, Chris. That's the point. You've got to figure out something well, where one, both sides well, can how, how about the plan that the House passed with Republican support 25 to Remember 6 in a committee the and the said, he the said speaker, he'd have a vote on it. Right, and he wanted to tie that to resolving the budget. He said he, would, he to promised to if, have a if, vote if on If there the, would be nope. a budget, if there would be a resolution to the budget, there would be a vote on the health bill. And so he's holding, a he's holding the, the health bill hostage. Well, the governor effect. is holding the budget hostage. No. Brad, you and I can just take a break. <laughs> I know, yeah. It's yeah. interesting yeah. that you asked Donna. Interest. I know Donna is claiming that uh, I, I'm a little confused as to what's going on here because Republicans around the country have endorsed Medicaid expansion and it's worked. If, and if, so the centrists sit around the table and watch us <laughs> squabbling and say, you know, guys, why can't you come to the table in earnest? And work this out. I mean, that is a real big question. And the, well, Which the bigger is why question that a debate would have been important because the governor had an opportunity to really show leadership, to sit down and say, "Let's talk about this." Everyone he did agrees that. He it's said a challenge. That. He no, said that. he refused to go. He Senator refused Berger to talk said, to the, he refused "Yes, to talk he would to go. the legislative leaders." No, he refused he to be part it. of the debate. That's according to the Raleigh News and Observer. Okay, Senator so Berger I'm, said, "You're yes. quoting the liberal media now." Which well, is we're. <laughs> We're arguing semantics to a certain extent. Here's here's the final question on this: Is anybody paying attention out there in North Carolina? Do they yeah, care no, about this I, squabble? Yeah, I tell, uh, school teachers in North Carolina are, are paying attention to it. Your university professors and college community college professors are paying attention to it because they're paying. They, they've got skin in the game. And the original budget passed by the General Assembly had a 0.5% pay raise for university professors. And then they had to add something in to try to figure out a way to override the veto. But, but now, listen, from a fiscal standpoint, the 2018 budget's not a bad budget. Mm -hmm. What was their surplus? $170 million last year? Exactly. I'm happy so, that they're using that budget. You know, Fine with me. Wow. Okay. Uh, let's switch. Uh, Mark Johnson ran for superintendent of public instruction in 2016, promising to shake up the status quo. Well, he certainly accomplished that goal. He restructured the upper echelons of DPI. He's had frequent clashes with teachers and has been in constant battle with the State Board of Education. Johnson selected the firm iStation for an $8.3 million contract to assess reading skills of K through uh, three students against the recommendation of a task force he himself formed. This month, traditional or district schools are supposed to be testing reading skills leaving the school systems in limbo as to how to do it. Jonathan authorized a $900,000 emergency expenditure uh, to help implement the iStation curriculum for the testing, but the chief procurement officer for the state says she might not authorize the purchase because he can't demonstrate it's an emergency. Donna, I want to discuss this latest flap, but let's go back to 2016 again. This was the year Trump won North Carolina by 3.7 percentage points. We also elected a Democratic governor, uh, Roy Cooper, uh, over incumbent Pat McCrory. Johnson defeated longtime Superintendent June Atkinson. Why did the voters vote for Johnson? The voters wanted a fighter. They wanted a change agent. They wanted someone to take a very large bureaucracy, and he successfully made this, this case on the campaign trail. It was a bureaucracy that had been doing pretty much the same thing over the years with 
pretty much the same ideas and approach and pretty much a lot of the same people. And it was time for a change. He's young, he can be brash as well. And we've seen that in the last couple of years. Sometimes uh, Superintendent Johnson is a little bit like a bull in a, in a china shop. But give him his, his, his due because he really has focused us on things that are important. What is the future gonna be like for kids? Technology, how do we use it? How does it help, how does it hurt? And reading, this third grade reading issue is critical. I give him credit, even though he's rubbed people the wrong way, credit for making sure that he's standing up for those kids. We have to do that. Well, he went away against his own task force. Well, but, no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that, Tom, because there was some <laughs> underdealing. There, there were some people on the task force who ended up being contractors for the yeah, company that had the contract. And it again. And, to the people, he picked them. Right. Well, I, I, I think there was legitimate concern about inside dealing from the people doing the requirements, setting the requirements for the contract. The bottom line is that uh, traditional schools, district schools in North Carolina, this month they're supposed to be beginning to assess the reading skills of students. And, uh, you know, there are two different ways of going about doing it. One of them is the traditional way that they've done it in the past in which the student reads to the teacher. The, the and there's a program, Amplify. I mean, yes. there, there are two different companies with lobbyists fighting this. It's important to understand underneath this is a fight about a contract where each side is making claims about the other side. The, the point where I'm real sympathetic to the superintendent is simply the law requires something to be in place. So it is, in fact, a real emergency. Now, you could say, well, good, superintendent, you should give in and get the, award the contract to the previous vendor instead of the vendor that, that you like. Uh, but his argument is, why should I give in? There was a problem with the contract. There was a, a, a second look at it. We awarded this contract, and then it was stopped by the Cooper administration. Instead of continuing to point figures, they've got to come to a quick solution because there, it is required to have some program in well, place. So the, the, the question the came year. down to the hearings this week as to whether or not this qualified as an emergency. And, and uh, from what I was able to gather from the hearings they had this week, Chris, they couldn't declare it an emergency. No, they couldn't. I, I do think we need to figure out a way to do this, but I don't think the superintendent has served the state well by by going against the wishes of a committee, as you mentioned, that he appointed and reappointed and didn't take their recommendation. Remember, this is a superintendent who bought iPads in, in a questionable manner and then had them sitting around and then doled them out on the basis of who emailed him. And by the way, I tried to email him to get an iPad. I was not. My email was not returned. Uh, that's the way we're literally spending state dollars at a time when we're talking about wait, state dollars are being wasted. I don't think he's done the department or himself any favor. Well, well I think he's, he's doing kids a favor, though. How is giving iPads to people who email him? How, how's the, he handled raised, the whole iPad issue was a disaster. Well, not every kid got one. He no, that's the point. You had to apply to get about 70,000 right. kids that were sent into fourth grade who shouldn't have gone Promoted. into fourth grade. I thought we all said social promotion, we aren't going to do that no, we anymore. We did, we he said that is we, out the there defending pretty, those the kids. The research is pretty no, clear that say, you We did say that. Well, There's the no research is pretty it. clear yeah. that when you do that, but, the kids yeah. actually suffer. And we could go on, and we talked about that several times on this See, show. This is about the pronoun we, okay? I don't think Donna was saying we around the table. I think you said there was a law passed, whether you like it or not, that disallows, for the most part, social promotion. For the most part. Good or bad, that's the law. For the yep. most part. There was also a, a, law, a program passed well, that was supposed to make sure all these kids had summer school help and a lot of other supplemental things that they didn't get. Here's what I think is going to happen. I think they're going to throw both of them out and go to a new starting point. But the question is, how do you implement it towards the end of the school year because you have to have the systems in place? Well, in last week's hearings, got even more bizarre because it was revealed during the course of last week's hearing that there had been uh, a hacking of a computer from a former high-ranking DPI uh, person, uh, and confidentiality had been breached, and that just opened up another can of worms. So here's what we got. We got the state superintendent, the State Board of Education, the Attorney General of North Carolina, the Department of Information Technology, and the courts involved in this issue. And so my question is, what is it going to take to get this resolved so our kids can benefit? And the question has to be, why, why does it, the superintendent of public instruction have the authority as a sworn constitutional officer to deal with this? And that's a real vid, valid question. And I think he is just taking his steps and just saying, I do have the responsibility, so if you all want to squabble about it, you want to go to court over it, fine. 
I'm going to concentrate on these kids. He right. wants a reading diagnostic, diagnostic tool in every classroom. You know, in 2017, Mark Johnson gave an interview to Carolina Journal. He talked about teaching ninth grade. It was a really compelling interview, and I would encourage folks to read it. He talked about having a 16-year-old boy in his class, ninth grade, and this boy was reading at fifth grade level. Now, what do we do for kids like that? What does something like that portend for kids who are in that situation well, going forward? Like that? Exactly. Yeah. That's what Mark Johnson is concerned about. Well, he's so concerned about it that he's running for lieutenant governor now. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I mean, you 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 said that uh, we you wanted have to, to ask him. we wanted well, to get I, a fighter well, in his superintendent. I think we got the fighting part of it. I think pretty well. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether the the children of North Carolina have benefited as a result of all of well, the squabbles. I, I would say that, again, there are partisans on either side of this lot, this contract dispute. As Brad gets at, you got a question who ultimately gets to award the contract. But I really hope that the judicial branch recognizes this is not an issue that can wait. There is a law. Whether you go with I-Station or Amplify, we got to go with something or some third party or something quickly. This is an emergency question. So, so you agree with the superintendent? that he was correct in making a $900,000 emergency. He is required to supply, DPI is required to supply a software package to state to, to the that state public school. That didn't seem to resonate in these hearings this week. I think you have and to therein give, lies the problem. I think you have to give the superintendent some benefit of the doubt. He has hit a brick wall when it comes to the education bureaucracy, and there's got to be some bend there. Maybe he, maybe the way he approached that to bureaucracy wasn't wise and confronting him when he first walked in and staying in his office and calling into conference calls from his own meetings and he was in the same building. He, I think he set a very odd tone when he took over the job, and I think that has lasted to this day. I, I did a little bit of uh, investigation on this, and I, uh, rightly or wrongly, whether the DPI bureaucracy is right or wrong, I'm not going to try to defend. I think there are an awful lot of people over there in the Pink Palace, uh, as they call the education <laughs> building. Billy uh, Watkins Palace. Yeah, Billy Watkins Palace who are just biding their time until 2021 when Mark Johnson is no longer there, rightly or wrongly. Uh, would you agree with that? I would. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and so, not necessarily so, Chris. But, <laughs> no, I, mean, I, think, I, think, I do agree yeah. with that, but I think that it's but easy to blame it, a faceless bureaucracy when there are literally hundreds of people who work there who do care about but, kids, and it's unfair sometimes but, to label them as some giant bureaucracy that doesn't but, care. But doesn't it raise the question once again that we really once and for all need to solve the education governance issue in North Carolina? I mean, absolutely. absolutely. Do we need an electric state, uh, elected state superintendent? And if we, we do, we might need an electric. Electric one would solve the problem. I think we have an one. argument for that. <laughs> Pardon my smell of fraud. Or do we? Uh, 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 does it? Do we, if we if we are going to elect a superintendent, do we need a state board of education? I think the basic problem is there's a misalignment, and this is not by no means the first time, and it's not even necessarily partisan. There's a misalignment frequently between the State Board of Education, it's appointed one way, elected superintendent. I think we should resolve that one way or the other instead of continuing the, the same process. the General Assembly wants to have a bigger role yeah. than they, they probably should. There's just too many cooks in the kitchen. I think Absolutely. We can, I and think we and can to your point, it's not, it's not that people in a bureaucracy don't care. I would never accuse someone of not caring. And, and you made, uh, made that point. Um, it's about being too big. It's about needing to infuse things with new the, thinking the and a new of perspective. The Department Instruction itself has been dramatically, dramatic, fundamentally reduced every year in the last 10 years. It's far smaller than it's ever been. It's huge and it's, it needed well, and part new of what, thinking. Part of what they do is administer federal grants, help struggling school mm -hmm. systems. The biggest, the biggest uh, number of people there help school systems that are trying to turn around. There's a giant uh, a group of people over there who are not the classic bureaucrats are working with kids every day. Well, I think we need a clean up on aisle three. I don't want to any <laughs> questions about that, but what's, we got a bigger clean up to talk about. What's being described as the biggest coal ash clean up in history. See, see the transition? Yeah. I pivoted. Uh, Duke Energy has agreed to a legal settlement with the State Department of Environmental Quality to dig up nearly 80 million tons of coal ash at six sites in North Carolina. Our Department of Environmental Quality ordered Duke to dig up the ashes at nine bases at six sites. Duke sued the department. We've just learned a settlement was made December 31st uh, in which the utility uh, agreed to dig up the ash at six sites, put it in lined landfills so as to make or to make building materials out of it. John, the, the big issue uh, the whole time over this coal ash problem is who's going to pay for the cost. Yes. Does this settlement make that clear? No, but it makes it more expensive. 
Uh, I understand entirely why Duke settled. I really do. They were in a difficult, link, particularly lengthy litigation. It's not in the public interest uh, because much of the coal ash being moved in the landfills w was never going to have a p public health or safety risk. Uh, so I, I just, I, and I do think that ratepayers will end up paying a big chunk of the cost, much of which will be unwarranted given the fairly scant environmental benefits. That's my view. Uh, the, the, that, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of disagreement <laughs> with the comments really? that John just made. Yeah, there's significant uh, evidence in a lot of environmentalist minds that, that, that these, uh, these unlined landfills, just leaving it where it was, is a significant risk. That's why they were pushing for a long time to, to line these, to move it into line landfills that are much safer. They, they can cite science that shows that. Uh, I think this was a settlement that was long overdue. It is a legitimate question about who's going to pay for it. Uh, yeah, the, the remediation, I don't think, was in, in as much question. Now, the arguments are this. Well, John just questioned well, it. Well, no, no, there's different ways to remediate. You, right. you, you have different solutions. They chose the most expensive solution. It's being described as a win-win for everybody, and I, I think there probably is some, some accuracy to that. But the situation was, okay, so should the rate holders be paying for the cost of I doing this? Holders... Let me finish my question. <laughs> Don't answer <laughs> till I finish. Should the rate holders be uh, paying for this because they are the ones who benefited from these lower electric rates all through the decades? Or should the shareholders be the ones, or should it be a com combination? It's a combination. Now you got the question. Uh, but uh, I agree with the second part of your question, is that we benefited from the cost of the low cost of burning coal sure. as an option for electrical generation. So I think it's a combination of both your shareholders and what your, your profit margins are, but the rate holders have a responsibility in this too. The I'll most underreported piece of this story is Roy Cooper's changing view on who should pay. Back in 2014 when he was Attorney General, he made a big deal of saying ratepayers shouldn't have to bear the cost of coal ash cleanup. There were news stories written about him being the protector of the consumer. His own administration has now signed on to a deal in which ratepayers are not protected. Why? When did he change his mind and why? I think that the real question that I've got here, uh, Chris, is this deal going to eliminate the threat of pollution? Will these lined Well, that's, pits... I think so. I mean, I hope so. I certainly think that was the point of the, of the settlement, is to give some folks some assurance that these, the, the, the worst of these landfills are not going to be leaking into the groundwater and causing environmental damage. I mean, that's literally, that's the whole point of the settlement. And yeah. the next big fight's going to be where are the landfields and do you go back that's to right. Warren County that's right. next to the PCB Well, they say they're gonna, most of them are going to be on the same sites. Same sites. Sites. The they, right. Yeah, they're going to be on the same sites to, to try to minimize, minimize the cost. I, one of the things that intrigued me about all this, John, is that they're going to take, uh, they're going to be able to take some of this coal ash and make concrete blocks and bricks and so forth like that to use it in the construction industry. Is it just too much of it to use all of it that way? Yes, and that is actually an area where there is largely agreement. And that's good because there should have been agreement about that. That is a good use of that material. There was another story very quickly that didn't get a lot of publicity this week. Duke, has, uh, Duke Energy has signed on with Smithfield Foods and Optima Bio uh, to produce natural gas from hog waste, these hog waste lagoons that we've got and they're going to send it down their pipelines to Piedmont Natural Gas um, uh, to help ameliorate uh, some of the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, sounds like another good news story there. Does it to y'all? Yes, and it creates a, a useful precedent for the 2020 election cycle, which will generate a lot of natural but gas. This is, but this <laughs> is just going to be a pilot. That As I understand, this company. is just a pilot project. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're just trying to figure out the economy of being be able utilized. to do it. Correct. And that's the important thing. Can a particular type of energy production make it on its own in the marketplace? Yeah. Um, or does it have to be subsidized? That's where we get into problems. Well, uh, he here's the discussion I'd like to have right now, to ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Chris? Uh, Missy Possewatch recently reported that Holly Grange, a state legislator running for governor, didn't report uh, a business on her economic statement of economic interest. That's a newsworthy item. The real newsworthy item was buried in that story that there are eight people who are responsible for keeping up with thousands, literally, of when, there's, when you involve candidates and public officials, of statements of economic interest, which is insane. And we have to provide more funding for the folks who are keeping the records and enforcing the laws that we have on our books about our elections. Interesting. Brad Crone, tell us something we don't know. Go Triangle spent $158 million on architects and engineers designing a light rail system that will never be built. Just imagine, Tom, if the city of the Gaderm had had access to some of that money to put into public Well, housing. that's a renewed effort to try to uh, renew that light rail. Uh, Donna Martinez, tell us something we don't know. 
financial relief coming to North Carolinians in 2020. That is because of the legislature's expansion of the zero uh, tax bracket. So that means particularly if you are a low income household or moderate income household, a greater proportion of your state income will be tax free. John. The conventional wisdom after the legislative districts in North Carolina were redrawn is that the House was a better opportunity for the Democrats than the Senate in 2020, but Cook Political Report flips that around. If there is a chance for Democrats to take a chamber, they say it's more likely the Senate than the House. Interesting. I was thinking it was the House, too. It is too. interesting. They Everything have... I say is interesting. <laughs> it's why you're What, they got to flip five seats? Is that what it is in yeah. the House? Yeah. And no, four in the Senate? Senate? Yeah, something like that. Wow. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Sign up for our free weekly email newsletter, give your feedback, and read my weekly column. Visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. And while there, subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel. Join us next week when we have more balanced debate for the Old North State. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Today's tools make you a real DIYer, and as a member of an electric cooperative, you have lots of valuable tools to help you do it yourself in controlling your home energy use and budget, leaving you free to be dad. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end of life decisions, your family physician is with you every step, for every stage of life, for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNCTV network.